Hi, welcome to the Getting Started in Telemedicine webinar series. My name is Anne, you can't see me, but I just want to go through a few quick housekeeping things before we get started. Um, there are, the slides are in the handout section in your panel. So if you want to download them, you can grab them now. Please ask us your questions via the chat box and then we'll answer them during the Q&A. Um, this session will be recorded and you will receive access to the webinar. Um, in two or three days. And you can sign up for the other webinars in the series at vc.com slash webinars. Um, and I think that's it. Maybe we can get a show of hands if you're having any, tr if you can hear me okay. So you should have a little hand raising, little hand raising um, icon. So I can get some hands there. Yep, yep, I see a bunch of hands, Thomas, Tanusha. Um, Maria, great. All right, thank you very much. So I'll go ahead and hand the time over then to Dr. Goldman and we'll get started. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Gary Goldman. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, which is being broadcast uh, across multiple Bay Area medical associations and uh, sponsored by the Alameda Contra Costa Medical Association. Uh, also included are Napa and Solano and San Mateo and a number of other medical associations. So my name is Dr. Gary Goldman. I'm a council member for the ACCMA. I've also been a practicing anesthesiologist at Alta Bates Medical Center uh, in Berkeley and Oakland, which is a Sutter uh, Health affiliate in the East Bay. Um, and I've been doing that since 1989. I'm also a serial entrepreneur in the digital health space. Uh, I've had companies in continuing education, international nursing staffing, and uh, cloud-based health provider data management and uh, credentialing platform. Um, I've also uh, been the uh, a physician informatics lead for Sutter Health for electronic healthcare record implementation. We use Epic, and I've been doing that for about eight years. I'm also currently the founder and CEO of Global Health Impact Network. We're a clinician-driven um, a collaborative network of clinical and digital health communities and we're focused on the ecosystem of digital health uh, innovation and uh, our vision and we feel it's imperative that clinicians play an active role in what we believe is the precipice of this ongoing uh, digital health revolution which uh, is certainly now being uh, accelerated with the uh, recent pandemic talk a little bit about the accma the accma is a professional organization Association of Physicians who are committed to addressing health issues to concern to patients and doctors in the East Bay. Uh, ACCMA provides a forum for physicians to come together to improve public health and the quality of patient uh, practice of medicine and patients' access to care. Um, this event is just one example among hundreds of activities that the ACCMA engages in annually to help physicians. These activities include political and public uh, policy advocacy, things like holding local meetings with elected officials on healthcare legislation, regulatory compliance, uh, things like ensuring network advocacy for covered California plans and helping members comply with Medicare reporting programs, uh, practice management assistance, things like presenting ongoing seminars like and webinars like this one on practice management topics and helping members with reimbursement challenges. Uh, this webinar is the fourth in the series of six, Getting Started in Telemedicine. Um, uh, we're be, going to be talking about patient-centered uh, care with Dr. Michael Harbour, which will be introduced by Dr. Uh, Chetapali in a moment, and Michael's the CMO of WellConnect. Um, the ACCMA is providing a quick guide to help physicians swiftly ramp up their telemedicine capabilities from technology to practice implementation to coding. Um, I want to take this moment to also thank VC and our Global Health Impact Network for hosting this webinar series and sponsoring it alongside the ACCMA. I'd like to now introduce uh, for today's program our host, Dr. Uli Chetapali. Uh, Uli is a physician, researcher, author, and innovator. He's currently the president of Innovator MD, which is a healthcare innovation company focused on physician entrepreneurism 
As a physician scientist, he's also interested in technology-enabled care. He received the Pioneer Award for Innovation from Kaiser Permanente and Morris F. Collin Research Award from the Permanente, Permanente Medical Group. His other roles include president-elect for the San Mateo County Medical Association. Uh, he's chairman, Society of Physician Entrepreneurs of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter. He's an advisor, mentor, and investor at various healthcare startups. And he's the author of the book, Punish the Machine, The Promise of Artificial Intelligence healthcare in Healthcare, uh, which is available on Amazon. Uh, Yuli, take it away. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, good afternoon, viewers. Uh, today we have an, uh, an exciting program. Our guest today is Dr. Michael Harbour. Dr. Harbour serves as the Chief Medical Officer of Connect Well and is a board certified internal medicine physician who specializes in HIV, AIDS, viral hepatitis, sexually transmitted infections, and maternal fetal health. Dr. Harbour attended uh, Georgetown University School of Medicine after completing a research fellowship at NIH and graduate medical training. He served on the faculty at uh, both Harvard Medical School and Stanford Univers University School of Medicine. He also earned a master's in public health from the University of California at Berkeley. He worked in Tanzania, caring for HIV patients, and has lectured throughout the US and internationally. He was also a speaker at one of our Society of Physician Entrepreneurs meetings. He worked for Merck and Company where he assisted in HIV and HCV medicine development. In addition, he has worked with at the WHO, WHO in Geneva on maternal health issues and was an invited guest of President Obama to the White House for the World AIDS Day. He is a recipient of uh, the Joseph and Rose Kennedy Scholarship for Bioethics at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. Please welcome Dr. Michael Harbour. Thank you for the introduction, Uli, and good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining. And I also like to just thank the organizers, which is the Association of the Northern California Medical Associations and BC for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. So the title of the talk is Telehealth 2.0, Optimizing Patient-Centered Care with Educational Health and Wellness Materials. And there's been a rapid development in telehealth services in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And telehealth allows patients to uh, uh, access critical medical care while minimizing infection and exposure in the medical setting. One of the challenges, however, is maintaining patient centricity, providing supportive health and wellness information to the patients in the absence of that face-to-face -face, uh, meeting. And patients still need to have their care plans reinforced and be given information that they can take with them at the conclusion of a visit to uh, uh, strengthen uh, those outcomes. I currently serve uh, let's see, why is my slide not advancing? There we go. I currently serve as the Chief Medical Officer of ConnectWell, which is a public-private partnership with the University of California at Berkeley School of Public Health, and it's a public-private partnership. And ConnectWell provides leading-edge uh, digital health and wellness content that's academically sourced, uh, evidence-based, designed for patients and a consumer audience. So not so long ago, the only method in which a patient or his or her family member had of obtaining information was directly from the patient at the bedside. Um, when the physician spoke, uh, the patient and the doctor um, uh, exchanged information. Usually it was unidirectional. The doctor spoke in, in a way that the patient just listened. But since then, uh, over the past 50 years, there's been so many other ways and modalities that patients receive information. And really the internet and telecommunication advances has changed a, a lot of that. So we'll be talking a little bit about that here um, today. Um, most recently, uh, the um, Centers for um, Medicare has uh, broadened 
what they allow for telehealth services. And many patients are now able to uh, speak to their doctors and care providers um, via a variety of different modalities, uh, making it more convenient, also decreasing risk to them by coming into a medical center where they can be potentially exposed to others who may, co may have COVID during this time. And um, the summary of the Medicare telemedicine services is seen here on this table. And the types of services um, that are available to patients are being covered in other discussions um, throughout this uh, series. But just to recap, there's the Medicare telehealth visit, which uh, can be a visit through a telecommunication communication source between a provider and a patient that can take place in a hospital, in a doctor's office setting, um, and that's allowed for both new and existing patients. You can have virtual check-ins, which are brief five to 10 minute check-ins with, with a patient, it can be just via a telephone call, and then e-visits as well for established patients through an online patient portal. So these are the types of, of services that uh, are allowed, and the regulations have been loosened a bit around, around HIPAA. It's still important to maintain that, but if people are acting in good faith and there is a HIPAA violation, uh, people won't be charged during this transition period. So telehealth expansion has occurred, as I mentioned, throughout this pandemic for the past couple of months, and there's been a major spike in these services nationwide and as they say, necessity is the mother of invention, and we're probably not going back. We're going to still be able to utilize telemedicine to a much more broader extent throughout the country. Um, but right here in the Bay Area, the San Jose Mercury News reported on April 9th that uh, Sutter Health has reported a 170-fold increase in visits related to telehealth. Stanford um, has increased their visits to over 3,000 per day. And Kaiser Permanente, which was already the leader in telehealth visits, has seen a 100% increase um, in their televisits. A major national telemedicine provider has reported a 257% increase in usage nationwide of telemedicine within hospitals, and also a 700% increase just in Washington state alone. So um, as any time you uh, rapidly scale up services, you have to consider quality control mechanisms and maintaining quality. Um, this is uh, paramount in no matter what uh, industry you are in. And optimizing baseline primary health and wellness is an important factor in risk mitigation of COVID-19 sequelae. So the better health one is and their primary health, the least likely they will be to uh, succumb to uh, bad effects of, of, of COVID. So this is an article that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in the fall of 2017. And I included it because many of the things mentioned in it still ring true today. So how physicians use telemedicine and how patients benefit. So clinicians have been using telemedicine tools for quite some time. They communicate uh, from clinician to clinician through uh, email, video, uh, telephone, or, or both. And a number of services have utilized these telemedicine services dermatology, radiology, surgical peer monitoring, ICU and trauma care. Of course, now there's clinician to patient um, telemedicine services, and that can take place over video, phone, email, um, remote wireless monitoring, the internet, and uh, many uh, different modalities are being utilized uh, as well. And then there's patient to mobile health technology, so wearable monitors, smartphones, applications, Etc. And then these can be uploaded and integrated into electronic uh, medical records. So these are the three main ways the physicians use telemedicine and patients are, are benefiting from it. That same article in the New England Journal of Medicine made 10 recommendations for continued telehealth research. And they're listed here, but I'm going to just uh, concentrate on today on the last one, which is the patient engagement and patient physician relationship. It's very important that patients still sense um, that relationship during a telehealth visit because ideally all visits would be done in, in, in person if at all possible, but there are many issues that make access and affordability and convenience difficult for many patients depending upon where they live, 
what it is they do for a living, their ability to get off from work, et cetera, their home and life situation. So telehealth has really filled a, a great need, but we do need to keep in mind the special relationship that a, that a provider and patient has. So um, many of the traditional care services that have been available in telehealth included cough and cold, allergies, diarrhea, headache, rash, UTI, single episode encounters that often didn't need much follow-up, a particular uh, prescription or a particular course of therapy may be uh, sufficient to, to deal with it. But um, now we've seen much more chronic care management. So we can see routine follow-up and checkups being done via telehealth and now chronic care management such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and even HIV management, which many people consider uh, somewhat uh, uh, difficult. But in my own practice over the past two months, we have transitioned to health, telehealth services. And for those patients that have already established relationships with me, um, it's worked out very well. Patients have been extremely thankful about not having to come to a medical center or they're very anxious about getting therapy. But in addition, I've taken on new patients as well. So patients whom I've never seen who are newly di diagnosed with HIV, they still appreciate the fact that uh, they have expert uh, advice to them. But again, they're not worried about coming into a, a medical facility during this time. Other uh, specialties include physical and occupational therapy, psych psychiatric care and counseling, such as depression, anxiety, substance use, and then the remote wearable evaluation and management. So uh, making changes in one's meds for atrial fibrillation and et cetera. Et cetera. So these are all being uh, conducted via telehealth. So we have a lot of chronic medical conditions in the United States. Many people live with chronic medical conditions. The CDC states that 70% of chronic diseases and their associated costs are related to unhealthy lifestyle practices. And 60% of Americans are living with at least one chronic care condition. And 42% of Americans are living with two or more chronic health conditions. So having all of these lifestyle associated uh, diseases, if you will, really makes telehealth a very convenient an appropriate way to check in on patients, to encourage them to make the changes that they need, to evaluate uh, their responsiveness to medications and treatment plans, and to follow up with uh, materials to enforce those treatment plans. So again, we have a lot of chronic medical conditions in this country, and being able to address these needs in a variety of ways, including telehealth, is very important. These are the top US chronic medical conditions by cost and expenditures um, as of 2017 through the CDC. And you can see number one is diabetes, followed by Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, arthritis, pregnancy, and postpartum care. And many of these are amenable to telehealth services. So we've had a number of companies that have cropped up across the country that are uh, uh, making available their telehealth services in a nationwide effect. So in addition to what an individual doctor or health center may be doing, we now have national companies. And so what I'm showing you here is from my own personal insurance carrier website. I went on to my website carrier and I can actually uh, have several choices in these national telehealth companies. I took out the names as to not uh, uh, promote one over another, but I'll call them telehealth company number one and number two. And on my uh, insurance website, you can see telehealth company one gives an uh, average visit length of 15 minutes. They have a patient satisfaction rating of 4.8. The estimated cost was is uh, $49 and, and, and to me for my copayment, $25. Telehealth company number two had an average visit length of 10 minutes with a slightly lower patient satisfaction rating. And so this is the disclosure information that uh, my insurance carrier is, is giving regarding um, what's available to me in terms of a national telehealth provider. And then I can choose um, based upon that. So there's a lot of competition going on and we have many other companies that are um, involved in this uh, as well. As you know, there are numerous places that patients obtain health care and health information. 
Some of them are reputable, others are not, but we're bombarded by these types of uh, sites daily, whether you're in the grocery store, in the checkout line, on TV, magazines, uh, the internet. And again, some of, these information, some of this information is good, some of it is, is not so good. And uh, you have to know where to choose. And choosing incorrectly can have disastrous health uh, effects. Um, reading some article that may not be vetted may decide whether you go on a particular diet or not, whether you decide not to vaccinate your children or, or not. And so the influence is, is quite significant. So where you get your health information really matters. And these are trusted sites for online health information that would be acceptable in the standard medical practice and amongst uh, mainstream physicians. And I'll review these very quickly, but these are sites that uh, practitioners can feel confident about uh, recommending patients go to, or perhaps they themselves uh, print out information from the website to give to patients. And I'll just review a few of these here. The National Library of Medicine and Medline Plus, which comes out of the NIH, are both reliable and up-to-date sources of information for patients. Medline Plus uh, can actually give disease state information. And then clinicaltrials.gov is a website that you can type in uh, your disease and what it is that you're looking for, and you'll find clinical trials that may be located in your area if you've already exhausted uh, you know, traditionally approved medications. So in this era, when we're looking at uh, in COVID uh, pandemic drug trials for remdesivir or hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, people want to know if they can get into a clinical trial. And this is where you would find that uh, information. The Centers for Disease Control, obviously in the news daily these days, and listing all sorts of disease information on COVID and a variety of different diseases. Uh, it's often used for travelers' health as well. So if you have a patient that's going to a, a particular area, you can decide whether they need malarial prophylaxis or what vaccines. So this is a very reputable site and should be uh, utilized uh, frequently. The Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion uh, lists um, primary care services that people will need. You can actually, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that I have outlined in a red box called My Health Finder. You can put in your age and your sex, and you'll find out what are the preventive services um, that you should be uh, obtaining um, at that time in your life. And likely, the US Preventative Task Force also lists um, uh, you know, cost-effective screenings and, and treatments that are, are necessary for people at different stages of their lives. They also uh, make uh, access to the healthcare, My Health Finder as well. State and local health departments are, are very um, important um, areas of information and specifically right now, um, daily you can go onto the California Department of Public Health dashboard and find out what's going on with COVID and each uh, area uh, public health department has uh, great data on what's happening with COVID in their area where hospitals are being um, overrun with uh, you know very sick patients and how many ventilators are, are left in a particular hospital and area so they've been very responsive to keeping up with uh, uh, information um, at, a, at the local level. Respected organizations is another place that uh, practitioners can um, access for um, information to disseminate to your patients, such as the American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, and the universities and medical schools as well is another uh, source of, of information. And we have some great centers right here in Northern California, Stanford, UCSF, Berkeley, which is the School of Public Health for the UCSF Medical School, other well-known places like Johns Hopkins, all provide great information for uh, patients um, and their providers to uh, disseminate trustworthy information. Medical societies and associations, such as our local chapters of the, uh, of the medical associations that are sponsoring this. And as 
as uh, practitioners and physicians, um, we rely on trusted and standard information to be able to treat our patients. FDA approved medications and devices are what we all prescribe. And when we go off label, um, we should be doing so with uh, uh, great caution to make sure that uh, we are still um, keeping our patients' best interests at, at heart. And sometimes we don't have uh, approved medications. And so we use evidence-based information backed by clinical trials. Um, these hopefully are randomized placebo-controlled studies, which are the gold standard. That's what's been in the news recently about the uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, even remdesivir. We are getting case reports, but we don't have the data for randomized clinical controlled studies. Um, and then expert recommendations from respected organizations are what we turn to when we lack uh, full clinical trials. So, um, you know, I, I put this slide here to, to remind me that uh, patients will look up health information all the time. And I'm sure all of you have had uh, patients and, and I'm sure yourselves have gone to the internet to look up health information um, on any particular topic. Patients will come in saying that they think they have a horrible disease because they read about it on, on, online. Um, so we've all seen that type of uh, uh, occurrence. We've done it for ourselves. And in fact, uh, searching for health information online is the second most common uh, internet search that there is. Online shopping is number one, and number two is searching for health information. And I would probably venture to say, given what's going on in, in the world and, and in the United States right now, people are probably looking at more health information while trying to get their groceries <laughs> delivered to their house. So um, uh, up to 80% of internet users look for medical information, including, um, including your patients. So it's important to, to remember. Um, this is a true story of one of my patients. Um, I, as I mentioned, I take care of HIV patients. I, I do so also for a lot of pregnant women that have HIV. They come to me to receive antiviral therapy and uh, counseling and evaluation during their pregnancy to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And so I started taking care of a, uh, a young woman, 32-year-old woman from, from Nigeria, and I started antiretroviral therapy for her. She did quite well. Her, her viral load went to undetectable. The baby was growing well, and she was feeling great. But in between visits, she had gone home and looked up something on the internet that said pregnant women should not be taking any medications whatsoever. It could cause birth defects to a baby. So without telling me, she had stopped taking all of her antiviral medicines. And she came back in the third trimester with an extremely high viral load, very low T cell counts. And I could not figure out what happened until she admitted that she had stopped the medications for fear that it would cause a birth defect. So I felt horrible about this. I know that we had talked about it, but I recognize that where patients are getting their medicine, I mean, their information um, can be so easily misconstrued, can be taken out of context. And we always have to be aware of that and be prepared to provide information that assists the patient, especially in this era of telemedicine, where we may not have as much uh, contact with, with patients. So some online search cautions is that uh, material can be uh, interpreted out of context. Sometimes these sites have a lot of sponsored advertisements. Um, be cautious of sites that look fake or require payment for additional information sites that promote quick cures, sites that offer miraculous instant or guaranteed outcomes such as fast weight loss, and then old and undated articles, especially for topics that rapidly change like cancer treatment. So when you go online um, and you go to a, a, a site, it's very important that somebody look up the date at the bottom of when that article may have been written. Is it current? So patients don't know to, to, to do that. And so that's why um, it's so important to be able to offer expertly vetted, trusted information that's easy to read and written at a patient basis for our or, or patient level for our patients, especially during this telehealth visit. So I wanted just to kind of mention a little bit about that um, as I wrap up and what I'm doing with the University of California at Berkeley and, and Connect Well. So let's just take an, a common online search. Um, 
patient goes to Google and types in back pain. If you type in back pain within a second, you will, or millisecond, you are going to get 1.6 billion hits. That's what it will tell you at the top of the page. It will tell you how many hits are available. And there are two general types of ranked results that will appear. appear. Sponsored ads um, or sponsored items such as advertisements and then organic items such as those that are delivered from a search algorithm. And these come from um, keywords that may be located within a page, how long that web page has been in existence, and the number of other web pages that link to a page in, in, in question. Also it included is your past and prior uh, search um, histories. Studies show that patients will only uh, click on uh, the first few hits that come up on that page, most of them being on the, that single page uh, or that first page. So the first result is usually clicked about 32% of the time, the second one about 17% of the time, and by the time they get to the seventh result, only 3.5% of the users will click that. So depending upon what those first few results are, patients are going to look at that and perhaps get the information that could lead them astray. And most average users will not go past the first five search listings. So again, very important that uh, patients get accurate information. Because if they're calling you up for a virtual telehealth visit, they are um, well enough aware of how to utilize internet modality, and they're going to be looking up things on the internet. So um, this is just a typical back pain uh, search. Um, what we see is you've typed in back pain and you're scrolling, scrolling down about, uh, you know, people ask, what is it? What is it a sign of? There's many different sites of, of patients can get information, locations that patients can go and get treated for, for, for back pain. Um, I'll just click on here, uh, uh, WebMD. Um, they have a back pain health center and give some overviews. Um, and then you, you click again and the other sites will, will, will come up. There's often sponsored advertisements for many of these sites, and then it starts going into core strength, strengthening for, for back pain. That may not have been what I was looking for, but it, it does come up in the order with which they want to give it to you, and then the advertisements are on the side. Sometimes you can get, open up a Pandora's box with many different uh, um, uh, items that, that come up during that, uh, that search. So what ConnectWell and the UC Berkeley School of Public Health has put together um, is a science-based, expert vetted, current, and um, systematic approach that does not include any advertising. It's in-depth and wide-ranging coverage of health conditions and wellness practices it, with short, easy-to-read articles and videos from, for optimal learning. University of California TV, um, is links to these videos are within the, the, the overall uh, program. The university has been a pioneer in wellness education for nearly 40 years, publishing the Berkeley Wellness Letter that I used to subscribe to when I was a resident back in, in Boston. And the uh, components of this educational program are divided into three parts. There's a health and wellness digital library, which is essentially all the disease states that you might be looking for information about. Then there are wellness initiatives, which include the behavioral things um, that one may want to do once they've been diagnosed with a particular uh, disorder. So eating healthy, staying active, managing your weight, musculoskeletal health, maternal health, healthy travel, better sleep, happiness and resilience, and, and managing stress. There are new uh, substance, I mean, new uh, therapeutic areas that are interventions that are being developed as well. And then the last component is on nutrition and, and healthy eating and recipes that allow you to do that. So I'm going to just show you a, a small demonstration. I'm going to click on this demonstration here, and um, it takes you to the Connect Well um, site um, through UC Berkeley. And as I mentioned, it's divided into three parts health and wellness library, wellness initiatives, and healthy recipe collections and nutrition. And um, there is a type of search toolbox that somebody can type in uh, back pain, just as they did here on Google, and back pain will, will come up. And so you can actually click on that automated uh, 
populated word, or you can go to one of the icons here that are, are listed here for many of the different disorders. So we'll click on back pain and spine conditions. And then what you get are uh, a list of 45 articles, beginning with the most basic article on the anatomy of, of, of back pain, what it is, how the spine's put together, basic information. You can view that article. And then as part of a telehealth visit, you can actually send somebody this link as part of their uh, care plan. They can actually then print it or in the office, you can print this out and give them information. This is easy to read um, with a sixth to ninth grade uh, uh, reading uh, level that we're, we're geared for, mostly sixth grade, but sometimes the technical terms, which are always explained, bring up the reading level to about ninth grade. There are related articles that you could uh, read in succession, and then you can uh, go back and look at other uh, information as well. But there's also videos here, diagnosing back pain, when to see a physician. So some people like to read, some people like to see videos, some people like to uh, do both. And so there's videos here that uh, are available for that. So these can all be sent to patients in a HIPAA compliant way, preserving um, private health um, information and be coordinated with the health plan uh, inf information and, and, and telehealth uh, program that you have for your patients. Um, we're going to go back here to uh, the slides. And so that's part of the overall uh, program here for this. Um, having the benefits of having a comprehensive content provider include just having one trusted and expertly vetted site. So patients don't open up a Pandora's box and not know what they're looking up. It's simple to search and access, one that should hopefully have a wide range of common health and wellness topics. And I like to give the example in, in medicine, many practitioners will use up to date. And so I like to think of the, the Connect Well services with UC Berkeley as the up-to-date health services for uh, searchable health services for patients. Um, by having a, a comprehensive content provider, you reduce the chances of obtaining incorrect information. There's no advertising. You can maintain uh, primary health um, information and HIPAA compliance, and it can be integrated into a telehealth visit to reaffirm knowledge and enhance patient outcomes. So um, this slide just reminds me that the heart of every encounter between a uh, patient and practitioner is, is that sacred bond of, of trust and wanting and the desire to, to help the patient. So when doing so via a telehealth visit, um, you can still maintain those bonds and develop those bonds with patients by uh, giving them trusted vetted information that will encourage them to follow through with the, the health plans that you're doing. Not all telehealth providers are, are doing this. And I think, as I mentioned for telehealth 2.0, that I think we should start expecting this. We should, uh, of, of telehealth providers and our, of ourselves to um, help formulate care plans, bring patients to the results um, that they want so that they can achieve their goals. So um, thank you very much. Um, here's my contact information. Um, my email is there should you wish to uh, further contact me about how you might take, uh, take advantage of, of some of this information or, or other information. And I'll open it up to um, any questions that, that people may have. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that was very informative and, um, and comprehensive. Um, I'm sure uh, you know our viewers are excited to ask you questions. In fact, we do have several questions that are popping up on the screen here. So Great. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go through uh, you know some of these and uh, I'll try to kind of condense them into a a bite-sized question. Uh, the first question is coming from uh, B Yoshi. Um, the question is, uh, how do you do a sensitive issue exam? For example, you know, how can you do a pelvic or a private part exam, especially if the provider is a male and, and, and the patient is a female? Sure. So obviously doing portions of a physical exam 
are one of the things that are difficult to do um, in a, a, a telehealth visit. Obtaining a culture, for example, if you think somebody may have a sexually transmitted disease, is not going to be possible uh, virtually. But certainly, um, a guided exam with a cell phone can demonstrate uh, herpes, um, uh, scabies, a variety of other things that, that uh, could be genitally related, hemorrhoids. Um, I've seen videos online of experts who know how to con conduct uh, virtual physical exams using helping the patient use their cell phone and, and um, manipulating the cell phone to show them the back of their throat, rashes, other parts of parts of their body. It's also very important to have a HIPAA compliant um, source so that none of those uh, videos are, are hacked and um, taken out of the wrong um, you know, context. So, so again, if, if it's something that you're going to need a culture for, an IND, some type of procedure, you're not going to be able to do that. But many other things um, can be done um, through this through these new modalities. Thank you. Our next question comes from Israel. Um, the question is, uh, can we use telemedicine for consultations with the specialists? So bring in the specialists while you're seeing the patient or for example, for a tumor board or something like that? Absolutely. So I've seen this done on a number of occasions. So there is a service that I used to participate in called Echo Health, where I was helping to treat patients with hepatitis C. And we had a multi-specialty uh, um, Zoom call, if you will, that included a, a social worker, a pharmacist, a psychiatrist, a hepatologist, um, a, uh, uh, the person's primary care doctor. And because this person lived in a rural area, wasn't able to come in and see a doctor easily, we, everybody was on this uh, consultative call together. And the hep C specialist happened to be in, um, in, in Texas, and the rest of the care team was in another area, and it worked out very well. So this is a great way for, for patients to live far away from medical centers to receive that type of uh, excellent consultative care. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Deborah. <clears throat> what, is, uh, what, are you, what is your suggestions for dealing with a, a, a patient who is uh, from the senior in a population where they may not be tech savvy uh, with using the apps and the cell phones? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Certainly, um, a regular cell, regular phone or regular cell phone could just give a regular telephone visit. Um, I, I know that I call my mom and like to show her, you know, my young son, and there's always this five minutes of, I can't see you, and um, flip the screen around, and it's not working. You know, there's, there's always a, a type of uh, technology that certain people aren't, aren't used to, but, you know, with patients, um, we always end up having our our, our, our little video chat and she is delighted at the end when she gets to see her grandson. But um, so patience is important. Having some handout that you can um, give to the patient ahead of time that will tell them exactly what it is that they that they need to do. And I think certain things are becoming easier all the time. Alexa apps that are being um, utilized and um, uh, Echo with, with video are, are being utilized a, a, as well. But certainly if, if the telehealth video component's not going to work, a, a phone call check-in can work and that would be allowed by, by Medicare. Yes, thank you. Um, what is your opinion about um, personal health records that are managed by the patient and you know how to include that into a uh, telemedicine visit. Yeah, so that's always a difficult situation when uh, some of the national telehealth companies are are having a, a one-off meeting with a, a patient 
and maybe they've called up for a sore throat and they may not have all the history. Maybe because the patient can't recall all of their history, um, they uh, omit some aspects of their, of their history to the telehealth provider and that can make it uh, difficult for the telehealth provider to give um, information. So having the primary care doctor is, is always, in my mind, uh, preferred if, if possible, but that's not always uh, possible. But um, I've always told patients to write down their chief medical problems. In my office, they always are given a uh, after-visit summary, which lists all their medical problems and their meds, future appointment dates. And so these types of things um, can be delivered via an email system for, for patients. And then being able to continue to give out that health and wellness information through those portals are important um, to hone in on treatment goals for, for patients. So hopefully patients will be keep, you know, keep some type of record um, of their diseases and problems that they can share with any telehealth provider if the telehealth provider is, is not their regular doctor. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, what happens when the patient invites their family members or their nephew who is a doctor or an uncle who is, uh, you know, living with them into the visit? Is there, are there any issues that we need to deal with? Yeah, so um, I think as long as there's consent, I don't see it as being any different than when a family member brings any patient into a, a visit. Sometimes you need somebody there to remember what the issues are that the patient discussed. Whenever I conduct a, a, a telehealth visit, I always ask that the patient have a, a pen and paper there to write down some of the things that I'm saying. And I will then try to email them supportive information and uh, health and wellness information that, uh, again, emphasize what it is that we discussed. Good. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, the next question is uh, about, uh, are there any HIPAA or legal issues uh, when it comes to, you know, a, a sensitive exam, say, um, that we need to consider? So I can imagine the, the premise for this question would be like um, in a, like a male gynecologist doing a female pelvic exam on a patient, you usually have a chaperone uh, their present um, yeah. in the room to um, uh, always kind of maintain a, a, a level of, of privacy and um, also uh, well-being for, for the patient, but also for medical legal reasons so that there's not a he said, she said type of uh, in, encounter. Um, you know, this is beyond my uh, level of experience, but I do see that this is one of the issues that were out that was outlined in that New England Journal of Medicine that needs to have further research and there perhaps has been um, research done on it. Um, some of the medical insurance malpractice companies that are um, insuring doctors may have guidelines on this. I just haven't come across that yet. So I, I don't want to answer without <laughs> having had the experience. Yes. Um. How do you do, uh, Jennifer asks, how do you do e-prescriptions? Are, are there any specific sites you recommend or? Yeah, so, you know, I, where I practice, um, we use Epic uh, electronic medical record system. So it has a built-in um, electronic medical record system and being able to prescribe. It also includes the components for uh, being able to prescribe uh, uh, scheduled uh, drugs with a, um, you know, the, um, the two, two source authentication. So whenever I prescribe a narcotic, um, I get a, not only do I do it through the, the website and have to put in a code, then I get an automatic uh, text from a, a, a vendor that authenticates my, um, my prescription. So it just depends upon your center and what it is that you're using and the software EMR system and um, interoperability issues. So I, again, it would just depend upon, you know, what's available for a particular vendor. 
Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on up to date uh, for patients? You know, there are patient information pages. Uh, yeah, so I, I really like up to date for medical doctors, as as you know, it, it is. It's very complex. It, sometimes it's very esoteric. It can take a long time to go through it as a doctor. Um, I have looked at all the different um, companies that put out um, information for patients. I really happen to like uh, the ConnectWell uh, product the best. Of course, I'm very biased, being the, the chief medical officer of ConnectWell <laughs> and also a graduate of UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And having started subscribing to the health and wellness letter newsletter 30 years ago when I was a resident in Boston. So I'm probably the most biased person out there in terms of wanting <laughs> to utilize, uh, you know, Berkeley School of Medicine. But I do know that there's other providers out there as well. What I do like about uh, the ConnectWell is that there is an API behind everything, which allows it to be integrated into electronic medical records at least to be sent to patients. So that's not available to all uh, in, in all different um, companies. So that's why I really like the uh, electronic format of the, the, the Berkeley program. Good, good. Um, Sherry asks, uh, if a primary care physician you know, is interested in, in transitioning into telemedicine. Uh, is it is it advisable to join a telemedicine group? I know you, you may not have covered this in your talk, but do you have any suggestions on you know going with just a prime you know primary telemedicine group and joining them? Sure. So it depends upon whether. Um, Sherry's looking to be employed by a telehealth company or continuing in her existing practice and then, you know, integrating telehealth services into your existing practice. So I, I know that certain telehealth companies are looking for full-time doctors. They don't want part-time moonlighters just doing a little here and there. They want to standardize all of their employees, and I think that's a nice thing. So. Certainly, there are nationwide companies that are looking for um, for employees, uh, so Sherry can apply to those. But you could also, you know, uh, perhaps work in a private practice that's local, so you could still see patients um, when necessary. So I, I think that if I had an annual exam on one of my patients that was in person and the rest were through telehealth where appropriate, that would be a nice combination of, of both worlds to be able to be a primary care provider, see that patient, and then the rest of the time having uh, virtual visits and engaging the patient with, you know, health and wellness information and following up with them like that. Great. Great. Thank you very much. I guess we are coming to an end uh, to our program, uh, but one last question. Um, do you think uh, providing health and wellness information, you know, you know, during televisits, would that become a standard of practice in the future? I, yeah, is I, it would, now? I, I would hope so, um, because I think it's too easy in order to just see a patient and be one and done. Um, again, as I mentioned in our in my talk, that uh, seventy percent of of our chronic medical conditions are related to lifestyle practices, and 60% of people have at least one chronic medical condition related to a lifestyle issue, and 42% um, and have two or more. So getting to the um, lifestyle issues is important. And I think this has all been really uh, honed in during COVID. We know that uh, if patients are controlling their diabetes and their weight, and their general health, um, they're, they're able to do better should they unfortunately become infected. We know that patients who are dying and having uh, severe morbidity and mortality are those that are um, quite ill with underlying conditions, and those underlying conditions include all of those lifestyle diseases. So I'm hoping that if we're going to transition to telehealth, that we should have quality metrics and process um, implemented, um, and uh, that would include 
covering all the telehealth, I mean, covering all the um, health and wellness components and primary care components that are that are necessary. So having a vendor that can support that would be important. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that uh, brings us to a close here. Um, thank you very much to everyone uh, who has tuned in to this program. And it's a and there's a quick reminder that uh, uh, you can join us on Monday, same time, 1230 to 130 for our next uh, uh, program in our series. We'll be discussing uh, legal considerations with HIPAA expert David Ginsberg and uh, healthcare data security attorney Alan Briskin. Alan Briskin. And thank you very much, um, Dr. Harbour, for joining us and uh, giving your valuable uh, advice and, uh, and uh, information. Thank you. And thank you. I appreciate it. And I'd like to thank Michael and you, Yuli for uh, participating in this webinar series. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure. Goodbye All now. Right. Goodbye. Goodbye.